Thank you all. I'm Connie Hogarth, and I want to uh, say how pleased we are that you're here for our second seminar on human rights uh, around the world and at home. And tonight we're going to be particularly fortunate, we are particularly fortunate to have someone who really can addresses both issues. Uh, and you'll hear more about Tanya Gunella Fritschner in a little while. But I want to um, invite you for next seminar, that's next Wednesday night, again, uh, probably in the French parlor, but in the castle. And the next one is going to be on the School of the Americas, which is why we pass some material around for those of you who don't know too much about the Fort Benning base, um, military base, uh, which we, is called the School of the Americas. We call it the School of the Americas. It's got another name now to sort of clean it up, but it's not a good place. And it's a place where foreign military have been trained, many of whom go back to their countries, particularly in Latin America, and become part of the death squads, uh, part of uh, the support for the oligarchies and the dictatorships. That's, how, that's with our tax money and with our immorality, or morality if we go down and protest both the funding and the, uh, and the uh, existence of this place, which would make a beautiful park someday. So um, we are sending a delegation of probably 14 or 15 students on the uh, 20th of November for that weekend down in Columbus, Georgia. And we're very proud of that. We've been doing that for years, and the numbers are growing. And uh, there's more interest. There will be people from many colleges around the country, from religious institutions, from every manner of uh, constituency there to, to speak for justice and for closing the School of the Americas. So you'll read that material, learn about it, and there's some material up here on it too. So that's next Wednesday night at 7.15. That'll be our third seminar. And um, we hope that you'll, you'll be here again. So now I want to, I just want to say that um, our guest speaker tonight, I consider a very dear old friend and a sister, and I am just so honored and proud to have her here. And one of her former students, Angel Morales, is going to introduce Tanya Gonella Fritschner. Angel, and Angel is a, a center activist. Um, first of all, thank you guys all for coming. Um, thank you guys for supporting our organization and our lectures uh, series. Um, and thank you, Connie, for. Okay. Okay. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Um, and I also just wanted to thank uh, Connie for um, still um, helping us so much with all these lecture series. Um, tonight, um, it's my great honor to welcome to Manhattanville, welcome back to Manhattanville, a truly inspirational and important woman. Among other things, um, she's an attorney, an activist. She's currently the president and founder of the American Indian Law Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization based in New York. And she's currently serving as a North American ambassador to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Rights. Also, for a few privileged members of our student body, um, she was our professor, our friend, and our mentor. Um, did I mention that this woman also is a cancer survivor? Um, she was born and raised in Syracuse, um, in humble means within the Onondaga Nation. Um, and Ms. Uh, Ganella Frischner is really a model of success that we should all strive to, as not only has she risen um, professionally and intellectually, she has risen uh, doing something that she loves, something both noble and difficult, which is uh, protecting and improving human rights. Um, I remember one day in our indigenous rights class where Ms. Frischner was explaining how change takes time. And for example, the Human Bill of Rights, which was introduced into the UN um, when it was founded, really took about 50 years to be universally accepted um, You know, for most of the world so far. Um, but I um, beg your pardon, Ms. Frischner, but I think that if we were all so dedicated and passionate about our work and activism, uh, change would not take 50 years. Change would have happened yesterday. <laughs> so 
Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, an esteemed professor and a personal inspiration, a personal inspiration, um, Tanya Ganella Frischner. Thank you very much, Angel. That was probably the loveliest introduction uh, I've had in a very, very long time. So thank you so much. And to all of you, which is peace. And, and um, I am glad and grateful to see that you are all well in the Onondaga language. Um, greetings to all of you. And um, I am happy to be back at one of my favorite places and uh, with some of my favorite people. Uh, Connie Hogarth being one of them, her husband Art being another, Professor David Eisenhower, Paul Meyer, a dear friend of mine, famous peace activist and environmentalist that many of you may know, um, students, professors, distinguished guests, and dear friends. Um, I'd also like to introduce to you someone very special to me, um, the woman who got me here, uh, who drove actually. I never drive when we're together. My sister Nanette. Nan, please stand up. <laughs> and um, I'd also like to introduce to you uh, the person who is going to record this evening. Um, thank you, Joe, for being here very much. Well, I, the last time that I was asked to be a guest speaker at Manhattanville College, um, I was given this very special gift from Paolo, and it uh, is a pen with my name on it, and it's one of my favorite treasures, and I still have it, and I use it sparingly so it won't wear out, and I still have it. So Manhattanville is a special place to me, and um, I had the privilege of being invited here by the Connie Hogarth Center for Social Justice. I also have the privilege of being on the board. Um, I was invited here by Connie and by David. Um, they invited me to lecture a class, but they were all also checking me out. <laughs> I should have figured this out, right, Nan? Mm -hmm. um, to see if I could hold my own and teach a class. So, uh, so they invited me to uh, be an adjunct professor and from that grew a very nice relationship and I started um, instructing in the areas of my specialty. Federal Indian law and history and also from there, I added to my repertoire human rights, which they very much encouraged me to do. And I had a um, many, many semesters of wonderful, wonderful students. And it was my joy. Um, I, not so much, I think, the students, but my joy of coming here and sharing what I knew and what I experienced. And that, that was the, the fun part, to say, um, no, that's not what Kofi Annan said. Wait a minute. You know, that's not what happened. Let me tell you the real deal. No, I was at that meeting in 1987, and it didn't go down like that. So I was able to share with the students some of the real deal behind the scenes, what was going on at the Human Rights not Council, but Commission back in the late eight, 1980s, um, back in the 1990s. Um, and those are some of the things that the students got um, hands on and some of the things that I knew were going on with the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Department of Interior 
or that the governor's office had been to the Onondaga Nation and had been talking about taxes, or that Mario Cuomo had been to the Onondaga Nation had, and had told our leaders, you're going to have a casino whether you like it or not, quote unquote. And these were things that I could tell our students that they weren't going to read in the New York Times, the Daily News, or that rag the post. Mm -hmm. Right? So I could share these things and, and they could then go back and sometimes um, I was told that um, I forgot what talk show it was and, and I got a kick out of this because someone called me and uh, it was apparently a t radio talk show and a, a former student of mine called and I not to sh I don't even remember what the the conversation was about, but a former student called in, and it was about casino gambling. And my student, one of my former students, called in and said, "No, you're wrong." And if my prof former professor Frischner were on the line, she would tell you in no uncertain terms. <laughs> and I just got a kick out of that one. So. The, the message gets spread far and wide and learning that um, being a teacher um, is only second to being the hardest job um, than being a mom. And um, I really learned to appreciate how hard, how really hard that, that job is, but also how rewarding it is as well. Um, so, so it's great to be here. My, what, what I wanted to share with you this evening and what Connie and I talked about was what I am doing now in the area of human rights. My, my position or my appointment as it's called is independent expert. Um, or human rights expert. Um, by the way, it's a non-paying position. Now, um, most of these uh, appointments as human rights expert, and they all have wonderful fancy titles, and you should be just really happy to get those appointments. Okay, so you should should know that up front. And, and all of these people who get these appointments work very, very hard. Very, very hard. And um, my appointment is to cover uh, North America, which includes for this particular position uh, the United States and Canada. Um, North America usually includes Mexico, but for the permanent form's sake, it's just the U.S. and Canada. So as an independent expert, I am supposed to make sure that I am unbiased in my position in terms of indigenous peoples, governments, UN agencies, intergovernmental agencies, and all other interested parties. Um, so, so it's a it's a big role in terms of making my making sure that what I do and what I say um, are balanced, and um, that I make the right try to make the right decisions and hear what I have to hear and say what I have to say in a balanced and fair way. And so far, so good. I haven't been challenged um, in a way that, uh, that says, you know, we're, we're challenging your statement or your position. So, knock wood, I'm okay so far. Um, but of course, I will admit publicly that my bent is, uh, is towards indigenous peoples. The position that, I, that I've been appointed to is uh, one of eight other indigenous peoples who were brought forward by their communities. Um, there are 16 members on the permanent forum, 
Eight represent indigenous communities and eight have been appointed by governments. Now, the eight that were brought forward by their indigenous communities um, are then finally appointed and approved by the Economic and Social Council, um, who are finally approved by the president of the Economic and Social Council. So you see how governments have the final say and the final word. So indigenous peoples as a body of peoples are now within the system called the United Nations. Well, once you've decided to be in the game, you've got to play by the rules and there are a lot of rules that you have to follow. Um, Echo Sock is, as you know, kind of way up there in terms of authority um, and in terms of prestige within the United Nations. For many, many years, indigenous people's issues were down in the sub-basement. Nobody knew we were around. We were in something called the Working Group on Indigenous Populations for many years. Um, and we sort of did pretty much what we wanted to do. If we didn't like something, we walked out. We didn't like something else, we boycotted. We, we raised hell, so to speak, okay? Well, now within the Echo Sock, and now that we're in the game, we have to follow the rules. And we can't raise hell like we used to, all right? Which is kind of boring a little bit. And it's also boring for some of our old activists, you know, that don't quite get that we um, have to follow the rules sometimes. So sometimes I have to get off the, um, the vice chairperson's seat because I'm vice chair of the permanent forum and um, mediate <laughs> and explain to our elders who are a little frisky. <laughs> Paul, you've been to those meetings. <laughs> and just sort of calm them down and talk about where things are right now and we will get that we will get to that issue and um, and, and usually things work out All right but it isn't it's different and it's very different and it has its pluses and it has its minuses too and we it's about balancing all those things um, so that's the, the challenge of being in that particular form. But I posed the question to my sister Connie. Um, there's this declaration, this human rights instrument called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was passed on September 13th, 2007. It was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Unfortunately, it wasn't adopted by consensus like everything in the UN. It had to be done by a vote uh, because there wasn't going to be consensus. All right, so it was passed. It was adopted by the General Assembly. Uh, 144 countries, member nations, voted yes to adopt this declaration, this human rights instrument that gives for the first time human rights and collective rights to indigenous peoples which make up close to, close, over 500 million peoples on every continent in the world these hu human rights for the first time. Four member nations vetoed the vote. They voted no. Eleven abstained 
and 33 member nations were absent. Okay, so let's go back to what those numbers mean. 144 meant that 75% of the world said, terrific, we agree, indigenous peoples have human rights. Great, all right, terrific. Finally, finally. Meanwhile, four countries said, no, we veto this. We don't agree. And who do you think those four countries were? Go ahead, take a shot in the dark. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Commonwealth countries. New Zealand. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Australia. Yeah, yeah. Those were the ones that voted no. U.S., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The Russian Federation abstained, all right, and that took a great deal of work because they were going to vote no. So we were very, very relieved that they abstained because an abstention means we didn't say yes, but we didn't say no. So that was good. China, China in the delegates lounge about a week before said to myself and a colleague, and we were just having tea, um, and we just blurted it out to, the, to uh, one of their representatives, as you know, we're blah, 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 the vote's coming up, uh, can, we, can we ask you, can we count on your support? And the representative said, yes, we will be supporting the declaration. And myself and my colleague were so stunned that we couldn't speak could not say anything. I just kind of went like this. <laughs> I thought, I'm hearing things. It's noisy in this room. I'm kicking my friend under the table. Did I hear right? But they said, yes, we are going to support the declaration. Now, this is how it works. If China said yes, then we had Indonesia, we had um, South East area, Vietnam, La Laos, Cambodia, and that area. And then more than likely, we would have the African Union, which made up 50, is made up of 53 countries. Within the UN, in order to keep your power, you have to vote in blocks. Everybody has one vote, Micronesia and the United States. They each got one vote. And in order to keep any kind of power, political power, you've got to vote in blocks. You've got to vote in regions. The Kansas group, which is the U.S., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, that's what's known as the Kansas group. They always vote in a block. So if the U.S. says no and Canada says no, then Australia and New Zealand are going along with the picture. Okay? So China says yes, we knew that the African countries were going to go along with it. Because the African Union, which is a block, we weren't sure about. And that's a whole nother story. 
And even if two countries within the African Union, and we knew it was South Africa and Namibia, who were borderline, even if they were borderline, if China went along with it, we were going to have a deal. And, that, and without the African Union, we weren't going to get the declaration passed. No way. It, not without 53 countries. And if we didn't have China, forget it. So it was like this gift, manna. It was just amazing. So this is how it was working. This is how that whole thing was working. Now, the question that Connie and I talked about was, well, you've got this declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. It's 46 articles. And there are several articles that talk about human rights, several different articles. Now, what does that mean to native peoples here in the United States? And how does that directly affect us here within the borders of the United States. We know that Article 3 of the Declaration is language that is taken directly out of the 1966 covenants, international human rights covenants, that were adopted within the UN and adopted by the United States. That language, let me read it to you. This language comes from Article 1 of those two human rights instruments. It's not new. It's not new language, so the question is, why can't those four countries who adopted those original international human rights covenants agree to Article 3 in this Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? And it reads, Article 3, Indigenous Peoples have the right to self-determination self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Right? And that's what those human rights covenants in 1966 talk about. Cultural rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights. So what indigenous peoples had been working for for 30 years. This work began in 1977 in Geneva at the UN. And some of those leaders were in the room on September 13, 2007, who had helped draft this declaration. Right, 30 years. People who had literally died for this work. One of our best friends, Ingrid Washinawatuk, died on a human rights mission in Colombia on this work, doing this work. You know, this, doing this work. Um, isn't like it isn't like a glamorous trip to Geneva, Switzerland, where you can go shopping and check out the chocolate. No, what um, you stay in basically a flea bag because that's all you can afford, and you kind of share your money so everybody can eat. And because your brothers and sisters from the south come there on a wing and a prayer, and you know that. Um, and you pull your money and hope everybody gets enough to eat. And the following year, 
and this is throughout the 80s and 90s, you don't see the same people that you saw the year before because some of them were killed, um, some of them were maimed, or some of them are in jail. Friends that you made the year before. Literally. People that I went to dinner with, drafted documents with, stayed up late with, translated things with. Yeah. So this declaration wasn't about, this sounds good, this sounds like good language, let's just draft it up. What do you think? Um, now let's just go check out the casino because the Hilton in downtown Geneva has one. No. This is about staying up all night long and then having a meeting at 8 a.m. And then starting again at 10 and then working all day. So the seriousness of this, I just, I can't stress enough. And when this was adopted on September 13th. Forty-four governments made oral interventions who had voted yes on this declaration. And they spoke about their hesitation towards this document. They spoke about their hesitation towards free, prior, and informed consent. The fight over this declaration was that if you come on our territories, mining companies, governments, um, NGOs, um, anybody well-intentioned, or any outsider, you must get the consent of indigenous leaders or the people based on a minimum standard of free, prior, and informed consent. And I would tell my students that free, prior, and informed consent is something that you get in the emergency room when you need surgery. You sign a document. Do you know what you're doing? Are you awake? You know you need surgery, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's what that is. Basic minimum. And indigenous peoples have not had that. When a mining company comes in, strips the land, pollutes the water, and leaves their crap to go someplace else, which they're still continuing to do. Okay? Many governments stated in the General Assembly room that this was giving indigenous peoples veto power. That's how they were seeing it. All right. So there were several statements by governments that were important to hear. And our organization wrote a paper on all of the statements that every government stated, those 44 governments. Um, we sat in the room and just wrote them down. Um, everybody else went to the cameras and because this was a historic day and it would have been nice to you know kind of pose in front of the cameras and mm -hmm. yay it got passed but we needed to hear what those governments were saying and some of the stuff was pretty amazing um, some was great and some was were things like the the UK um, made a statement about legal process that is now starting to resurface that sent up a red flag to many of us a couple of years ago and now it's coming up again. Right, so always things that you have to be on the lookout for. All right, and your antennas go up and go, hmm, what's that all about? When are we going to see that later? Well, now is the time you, as members of civil society, need to um, jar your leaders into adopting the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Australia this past May announced 
that it adopted as a government the declaration. So now that's one down, three to go. There's a new president who tomorrow is going to have a historical meeting with 364 tribal leaders at uh, the Department of Interior. Right? Um, not that I'm tooting my own horn and I don't mean to sound that way, but I have helped brief um, some of those leaders on the meeting tomorrow. And a couple of those leaders, if they are part of the dialogue, and let's hope so, will pose the question to the president, you must sign the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So if that makes the news, and let's hope it does, that will be historical. Let's hope so. But you, as his constituency, need to ask why and when. When, Mr. President, is this government going to adopt that declaration? And why is it that you do not believe that Native Americans have human rights? Simple question. Deserves an answer. That's what the State Department is for. That's what civil society's responsibility is to ask their leadership in terms of accountability. I mean, that's how I see things, but, and that's how I think things should be posed to leadership. Why is that? Why is that? Last Friday, um, I was invited to a listening conference, it was called. Um, it was called an, a, an annual tri tribal consultation. But it was the first consultation with the Attorney General. It's usually with the um, Justice Department but with members of the, the Federal Justice Department, U.S. Justice Department, but the Attorney General was there. And um, I did manage to, I was invited to make a statement, and I did manage to state to the Attorney General and his aides, uh, and the other Attorney General, generals that the declaration must be adopted in all due haste and that tribal leaders were going to bring it to the president's attention November 5th which is tomorrow so the the road has been paid for that to begin because it isn't an international issue it's a domestic issue and human rights are civil rights, civil rights are human rights. It's not different, it's all intertwined, it's all the same and we as part of a local community, as all part, we're all part of a local community, I think we need to understand that, that the UN and the international world is not over there. It belongs to us. We're a part of it. And we have just told our leaders um, that we want some of our leaders to go over to that meeting and to represent us accordingly and appropriately. That's all. And then come back and report. But it's not something that should overwhelm us or make us feel like we don't know, uh, we should make it our business right? and make it a part of our local thinking and our community work because it is our community work. It's about our, the, the good health of, of our communities and my sister and I were talking about that earlier. 
right? The, the, the treaties that were made, that our people made with this United States are like the strongest treaties in the world. And in exchange for the land that was taken legally or not, and in the mo most cases not, the promise was, like a contract, you get something in return. It was the protection of the health, education, and welfare of Native people forever. All right, so it's not a piece of welfare. No, no, it's a right. The education of our people is a right. The health of our people is a right. All right? It, it is not something that is just given as uh, a token. And, and we, we, as communities, need to understand that. All right? So we throw you a bone and you need to shut up. No. All right? If you're sitting on our territory, then there's an exchange for that right. And that's part of it. So it's, it's like bringing all this information forward and um, making people responsible for also getting that information. And most institutions don't do that. Right? It's rare that you get that information. Most law schools don't even teach American Indian law or federal Indian law, even though there's almost a 30% chance that as an attorney you're going to come across an issue that has to do with American Indian children, land, law, health, something. Shouldn't it be in law schools? Absolutely, absolutely. When I was in Minneapolis at this listening conference, um, one of the women that spoke, a friend of mine, Sarah Deer, she's a um, professor at a law school in Minneapolis, she announced that there are a total of eight, eight Native people who are either um, tenured or waiting to be tenured um, law professors within the entire United States. <laughs> yeah, because she is, she has not even gone that far. She's not even up for tenure. She's beginning to go through that process. So there's a total of eight that are not tenured, but tenured or up for tenured in all of the law schools throughout the United States. And we are sitting on indigenous territories and a third of the cases that go to the Supreme Court are have to do with American Indian issues. You know, what's wrong with this picture? I really, I had no idea. I had no idea. You know, even the Attorney General went, <laughs> wow, that's quite amazing. So I don't know what it is in undergrad. I'm sure the numbers aren't any better. But that's just quite, quite astonishing. But anyway. What I would like to do at this point is maybe have a dialogue or ask me some questions and we'll go back and forth, whatever you would like to do. And, um, but you're going to have to speak up or maybe even come forward and speak at the mic because we're, we're recording it. Joe would like you to come forward and speak in the mic. Could we have students first? 
Tani, you you um, do the question. No, just, I, I'd like to have students who have comments or questions. Raise your hand. Students you first. first. Don't you like that? Students first. <laughs> My question is, um, tomorrow will you be there at the event, and if so, what will your role be? No, I will not be at the event. Um, uh, there was one invitation for each federally recognized Native nation. Um, there are, and I always have to throw in my two cents, right? There are over 550 unrecognized Native nations. So there will be a whole chunk of Native people who will not be represented. The only nations that were invited were federally recognized. So for instance, the Shinnecock people on Long Island, they are recognized by the state of New York but they are not recognized by the federal government, so they weren't invited. Yeah, so, um, so it's one invitation per nation. So the Onondaga Nation will be represented by um, Chief Sid Hill, who is our Tadadaho. He is the um, spiritual leader for all the Six Nations. He will be there. Um, I remember when we were at the permanent forum um, in 2007, 2008, um, and the indigenous people um, uh, grabbed the microphone in the ground and demanded more, um, more power in the forum as it was designated for them. Has there been improvements? Have they gotten more? Uh, of a role in the in the forum in the last um, year or so, in the last two years? Great, great question, Angel. What, um, what Angel was referring to is the last day of the permanent forum on, in 2008. Um, there, um, there was a bit of a um, what would what would the polite word be, Angel? Um, a, a disruption. Um, a little bit of a chaos on the floor. Yeah. Um, one of those things, Paul, where um, you need a uh, a referee. Yeah. Uh, or a security guard. And there there were. There were uh, several indigenous peoples who were not satisfied with um, being heard, and they were asked, they were asking to be heard by the chairperson of the permanent forum. And um, for some reason, uh, this was not happening. And what ha what happened was they they started knocking on the tables and there were there were some disruptions and they were calling out to be heard and then of course once that happens the um, the security gets gets very nervous um, and they get nervous especially because um, if security views anything disruptive um, in that in that case, they sometimes view it as a demonstration, and demonstrations are not allowed within the premises of the United Nations. Okay, so they can ask people to leave. Um, the security guards can intervene and ask pe uh, people to leave, and of course that becomes a huge insult. Um, to people who believe this is our meeting and we're not going anywhere and it, and it did get uh, very uncomfortable um, but things did get smoothed over and it, it did get um, taken care of um, and what happened was 
the permanent form started to um, extend the agenda so that there was more time for indigenous peoples to speak. The, the agenda is so packed with a business that has to be done because it's a balancing act. Governments want issues taken care of. Business has to be done to meet the requirements of the Economic and Social Council. A final report has to be done and adopted by the last day of the permanent forum. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing balancing act. And the final report has to be ready in different languages so everybody can read it. We're talking about six different languages. So, and then you have all these different agenda items. So it's hard to get to that point. And if you're an indigenous person that's come from the continent of Africa, or you're from the Amazon, or you're from Southeast Asia, and you've had to walk, take a boat, a canoe, and your people have gathered money together to get you to this permanent form, and you've waited six months for your visa, and you've paid two months' wages for uh, the permit, for the United States for what they charge for the visa application and you've come with your statement and your community's waiting for you to come home and they want to hear that you spoke inside the halls of the UN and you weren't called on you're going to be a little testy so and there are Last year, in two thousand, the last year, this past year, in two thousand nine, there were three thousand indigenous peoples who signed up for that meeting. Now, the meeting is two weeks long. Two, two weeks long. Governments insist it's their forum. They put their flags up. They need have to be called on. They need to be heard. UN agencies. All of the permanent forum members, 16 of them, it's our forum, so we have to be called on. Plus all of the indigenous peoples. At three minutes to five minutes each, how is that humanly possible? Can't be done. Can't be done. Right? And then if a government has a meltdown, which when I was chairing, a couple of governments did. Um, then you got to wait till things settle down and they have to talk. So it's, it, it fur flies a little bit, and tempers flare, and yeah, yeah. So it, it's really hard to um, meet everybody's needs. It really is hard to do that. Um, and I think our current chair does the best she can under some really grueling circumstances. Plus, the permanent forum has to meet behind closed doors to get our work done. Um, and then that may be a half a day, so that, that cuts out um, our plenary session. So it's a... It's, uh, it's a challenge. Well, those who mm -hmm. Obama legal staff is likely to say is, is this, that is, you're saying that the language in Article 3 of this mm -hmm. is, is drawn from the language of the International Covenant of Economic, Social, mm -hmm. and Cultural Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, Article 1. Right. Now the problem is, Article 1 of those two covenants has the phrase, states, parties, the state parties are agreeing that they would, that if anyone comes onto their territory, that they will get prior warning and they will give informed consent. They'll get all the necessary information. All right. Okay. So this this is in in the context of the international uh, covenants. That's a guarantee of state sovereignty. 
But in Article 3 of the Indigenous Peoples Act, it's a guarantee of the sovereign rights of indigenous peoples. And the problem is that there is no uh, recognition of peoples in the, in, in the UN legal system comparable to the recognition of states. And the states are extremely jealous of their sovereign rights. They don't want to grant sovereign rights to peoples when there isn't even a generally accepted definition of peoples even let alone indigenous peoples that they've signed on to. So they're not going to give, they don't want to give people sovereign rights in the same sense that, say, Israel doesn't want to give Palestinian people sovereign rights. Same issue, okay? And so I think Obama's legal staff is going to tell you, well, you're asking for rights that no other people in the United States have. For instance, Greek people in the United States don't have those kinds of sovereign rights, and individuals don't have those kinds of sovereign rights. That is, if the police want to come in to come on your lawn, right, they don't have to give you prior warning and in full information about what they're doing. Only if they're coming in your house do they need a warrant, and for that matter, a lot of them, you know, will find, try to find some way around that. And so the, the state, I, my guess is that the states that have been willing to sign on to Article 3 of the, uh, of the indigenous people thing are ones that do not have reservations in the way that the U.S. and Canada has. And so the peoples, that the indigenous peoples that they're referring to don't have recognized territories which then the state would be barred from exercising sovereign rights in. And that's, my guess is, that's the reason that some countries are willing to sign on to it, because it's not going to make an effective difference for what their police and military can do. Whereas the U.S. feels that if it signs on to it, that's going to mean, hey, they can't have a cop go on to a reservation. They're going to have to first go to the Indian police and have the Indian Council do this. Whereas there's only, so far as I know, one place that has made that kind of arrangement, and that's in Alaska. That is, in Alaska, right, there are tribal councils which have kind of semi-sovereign powers, as some of the northern Indian groups do, like the Dene Nation in, uh, in, in British Columbia and the Northwest Territories, because they have large tracts of land that only they really know. Right? And so, the, and, and, the, and in, in that case even, the Canadian government is still leery of giving full power over that because they haven't investigated the mineral rights that they are interested in, and they're afraid that they'd be depriving some, you know, mining company or oil company of, or shale oil company of something that they want, you know, and finally, suddenly the Denny nation will become fabulously wealthy, right, and, right, and, yeah, et cetera. And so I think that's the the issue is that they're not going to regard the language of Article 1 and Article 3 as identical. Yeah? Is you agree? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Richard, that's a good one. Well, this would be, would be my response. And, and you are absolutely right, right on point as to what that argument has been with, um, with the, uh, the legal departments of Canada and with the US. That has been their argument. But what they also fought for is putting in that language, basically, in Article 46 of the Declaration. And here, let me, let me give you, you, if you look at Article 46, okay, it, what Article 46 does is it basically says, well, all right, we, all of this is all well and good, okay? However, um, nothing in this is going to be construed, as you can see, as authorizing or encourage any action, blah, 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 impairing, all right. Now, what we did, and what we had said um, throughout this discourse of arguing with the U.S. and with Canada 
we stated that if you, if Canada and the U.S., and we had the African countries who were willing to go along with this. They had agreed to this. But somewhere along the line, and you don't know what kind of horse trading is going out in the hallway, because we're not privy to it, what we had suggested was, and we saved this to the very last minute because we knew this could have been our last trump card. The last trump card was, you've got the Declaration on Friendly Relations. It's a 1970 declaration. And what it, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. It, it's, it establishes and acknowledges the territorial integrity between two nations, between two states. We said that if you put in that we will acknowledge that declaration in our declaration, all right, that we will not violate that declaration, and, and we will let you put that language in here, we can go along with it. And Afri the African countries said, really? And we said, but you can only state it. You cannot go, th you cannot extend the language like they did in their final draft here in 46. They went on and added all this additional language. We didn't agree to that. We said if you just state it, we can get go along with it. What they ended up doing is expanding on it and now it basically says in our interpretation that we are brought in as a third party. Now you've got two states plus indigenous peoples, and indigenous peoples violating the territorial integrity of governments. Well, we were never part of that discourse. We were never part of that discussion. Why would we be a part of it now? And that's what they did at the last minute. And that was the United States and Canada. That's what they wanted. And we knew that that's what they wanted, just what you said. And that was our last trump card. But they said, all right, we'll go along with it, but then they expanded it. They had to describe exactly what we didn't want them to describe. So now it's a matter of how are we going to interpret Article 46 10 years from now, 5 years from now, and it's not going to be good for us. I don't think. Other people feel differently. Other indigenous people say it's not a big deal. I don't think we should worry about it. I think we should worry about it. I don't think we should be brought in as a third party in this discussion. There's no reason for us to be brought in as a third party. Please. But that the concern of U.S. Uh, the U.S. and Canada is actually limited to relations with indigenous people. What I think is probably actually going on is that they're terrified of signing a statement that includes indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. Not because of what they've been granting to indigenous peoples, but because they think they're on a slippery slope then. Because once they've said that, then the next step is they think people are going to come from all over the place saying, you just said peoples have the right to self-determination. We're people too. Mm -hmm. Palestinians are people. Bosques are people, right? Um, the, the Catholics in North Ireland are people. That is, the, the U.S. is terrified of setting a precedent which can be used to justify civil war. Mm -hmm. and, yeah? I, and I think they're wrong. But, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I think they're wrong. Madam? But we have to look forward to. And I think those are the arguments that are come on up, that are are looming ahead of us and we need to get ready for them. Because what you said is what the UK alluded to in their response right after the adoption. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Of course.
Um, hi, good e Hi. Um, my question takes a slightly different path, but maybe an, a more op optimistic one, but hopefully a little less complicated in that, okay, Obama did say that treaty law is paramount law or something to that effect. And um, also, Wangari Mathai of Kenya has said she's referred to the terms micronations and macronations, uh, sort of echoing the, the, the macronation being the state nation and the micronations being all the, the different ethnic tribes. And, and I think that we um, see that throughout Africa. We see that throughout the world where there's been the oppression of colonialism. Uh, of this taking place, uh, of there being ethnic conflicts um, largely caused by the imprint of, of, of imperialist forces. My question is that if things hopefully take a more positive path and Obama signs on and the sovereignties, the sovereignty uh, is begun to gain power, um, within North America, within the United States, Canada, so that we have uh, more equity and, and a bit more of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Onondaga, with mm -hmm. Seneca, with Lakota, then I wonder if you could help us envision what the 21st century might look like in, in, in the area of North America. In other words, Europe has now an EU, and I'm far from any kind of political expert to know about this, but we think of all these different nations uh, with more or less equality operating somewhat harmoniously. And, and I realize that that's not a perfect picture, um, but I wonder is there some ideal, uh, maybe that's too strong a word, is there somewhere, is there a better place we can go to um, that as our economy is crashing, as our environment is crashing, I think we're looking for, for real change. Um, and and, and is, there, is there some sort of, of uh, opportunity here for greater sovereignty um, that would bring about a new sort of social and political structure? What's your vision? Well, I would, I would share with you, but and, and I want to do this before, um, before I forget. I'm just jotting this down, so bear with me. Um, what our what our leaders are saying, the, our traditional leaders, especially where I'm from, are saying right at this moment that the thing that is most troubling that we have to give our 100% attention to is climate change. That if we don't deal with it, um, nothing else uh, is really going to matter at the moment. Um, that it is real, that the, the message has been, brought, has been brought to us um, in the mid 80s by elders that came from Greenland to one of our meetings. Um, we call him uncle because his name is so long that you can't pronounce it. So uh, he lets us call him uncle. And I think I shared this with some of our students. Um, but, but uncle had in the, in the 1980s had, knew that there was an elders meeting that was being held in North America and his, um, his community said go to that meeting and he found the meeting just he found it it was in North America and he found the meeting and he, <laughs> he came to the meeting and he said um, the message is the ice is melting, and um, you have to know this. And it's very serious, and it's very dangerous. Um, and that was his message. And it is very serious, and it is very dangerous. And don't let anybody 
tell you any differently. Um, one of our great leaders, Leon Shenandoah, who was um, uh, an uncle to my sister and I, what he would say to young people, anybody who would listen to him, um, any young person, native or not, he would say, if you can find a piece of land, grow a garden. Anywhere. Grow a garden. Grow your own food. And I don't know how long we heard this. In the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. He passed away in the early 90s. Um, grow your own food. And what are we talking about today? Food security. All right, that's the, the big focus right now, food security. And what he said in like the late 80s, he basically said, I have been, he was our, he was our spiritual leader who we refer to as Tadadaho. And um, he had said, like in the late 80s, um, he said, I, I know I've been calculating um, where the earth is going and how things are going. And I think um, what we have is maybe another 20, 25 years before things tip. And what are they talking about now? A tipping point. I mean, this... You, you know, you, you talk about leaders with vision and who knew and, and who saw. And this is where we're going. And folks, we have to look at this. We have to do it. And I'm sorry, young people, that this is what um, my generation and other generations are leaving you. But this is the reality. And you have to address it. You have to do it. You've got to take it on. Um, and that's the way it is. Um, and you can't whine about it and be mad about it. You just got to get up and do it. Um, you've got a country that's going to Copenhagen in December, and they're going with a um, um, a piece of legislation that came that's coming out of the Senate that the Connie Hogarth Center. Um, analyze that I have been using and bringing to meetings and it's one of the best pieces um, that I have read and you should keep it in your briefcase because that piece of legislation is a piece of junk and you should know it. All right? It's a piece of junk. And John Kerry's sister is a friend of mine. You know, and John Kerry is a decent guy, but that piece of legislation is junk. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what? It, it's, that's all I'm going to say on that one. You've heard it all, you know it, and those are, those are the realities. The future, and why I, why I had to say that was there will be no future unless the reality of today is dealt with, okay? Because most of this area will be underwater if it's not dealt with, right? And that's the reality. But the, the vision for the future, if we can get some control over consumption and everything else um, is what our leaders say is don't let it happen on your watch. And you can only do what you can do and basically that's all that means. Um, I can only do my fight, my work as best as I can do it. I have really no control over anything else. Um, and I have the responsibility of looking out to that seventh generation that has not arrived as yet. That's all I can do. And that's what the leaders are told when they are installed as leaders. And that's their responsibility. And they are told that they are to 
govern with a good mind. And the good mind is to include peace for the people and nations and equity for the people and the nations, justice for the people and the nations. Um, and those are the three things. And if leaders were to act with peace, equity, and justice, and with the power of the good mind, then we'd be okay. We'd be all right. But to make decision based on the seventh generation, and that's, that's the Iroquois um, tradition. Those are what our leaders are told when a chief is installed as a leader. Okay? We call it a condolence ceremony because a chief has died and the community is in mourning. So we p install another chief all right, and wipe away the sorrow of the community. That's why it's called the condolence ceremony. We install another chief, and that chief is, is given and told to act with a good mind. All right. And the women have the power to install those leaders, not install them, but to begin the process of choosing who those leaders are. And we also have the power of recall. So our men and women govern with equality. Right? So there are, there are basics um, to our governing structure, to our way of life, and um, and my, my vision is not a vision, it's just a way of life, of looking at the world. And hopefully I carry that on a daily basis. At least I try. I do the best that I can. Um, I'm just, you know, not any different from anybody else. And just plot along and do the work as best I can. Um, and hopefully... Um, Things won't implode on my watch, because <laughs> that's the best you can do. All right, and, and those are the kind of instructions that you get when you do your work. Don't mess it up on your watch. Connie? I think one of the most agonizing cases of human rights and justice is, I, wonder, I don't know if everybody knows about Leonard Peltier mm. and the current yeah. of his incarceration and he should have been released decades ago. Oh, yeah, this is this is a long one. Um, yeah. Leonard Leonard Peltier is um is incarcerated and he's been moved around several times. Is he in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I think he's in imprisoned in Pennsylvania right now. Um, but he's been moved around quite a bit. He is charged with the murder of two FBI agents um, in the 70s. And um, in um, in South Dakota, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, which, by the way, is um, the poorest place in, um, poorest county in the country, in the United States. Um, the, the special rapporteur on housing for the United Nations was in Pine Ridge um, this past week. Um, because Pine Ridge invited her to come visit. And I, in fact, I brought um, the press release from that visit because I wanted to share it with everybody. And what she saw, um, she said she was just horrified. She didn't know that this kind of poverty existed in the United States. 
Um, so it was really great that the um, International Indian Treaty Council and NGOs like them and the Pine Ridge and the Lakota made sure that that special rapporteur came to Pine Ridge to see for herself what housing is like out there. She saw people in, in a two-room shack, um, families of 20, 25 people living in, in housing with, um, you know, broken windows and, and just unbelievable poverty. And she will give her report. Um, so, so this is important and, and good for the United States for giving permission for the special rapporteur to come in the United States because uh, it, those rapporteurs can't go to a country unless they get permission from the country. Um, so she, she's visiting Indian country and that, that's, that's great. That's really great. And Peltier was killed, that's why I say that, on Pine Ridge, not killed, I'm sorry. He, he um, was part of the American Indian Movement um, during a very, very difficult time. And um, he was charged with the murder of two FBI agents. And um, the, um, there was always been a question of the evidence, question of the uh, of procedure, and um, he has had many, many appeals, and he's lost those appeals. He recently had a parole hearing, and he lost that. And I think, I really think, kind of that um, the possibility of his release is not going to happen. No, I, I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, but the work that he's been able to do as an incarcerated person has been amazing. Has, has looking at what he's a, been able to do that way has, has been amazing. And if you want to read about his story and about that time, because it's a really long story and it and to do it just as you need to talk about the 60s and the civil rights movement and you need to go into the 70s and what was going on at that time why the American Indian movement came into being what was going on at that time and why all of this happened and what was going on with the federal government what was going on with the elected government um, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, um, and all of those pieces. Um, read In the Spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Matheson. It's an excellent book. The original version was burned by Viking Press. So I, I have one of those original books. Never did I think the, that version would be burned. Do you have one too? Yeah. Yeah, he was sued by Viking Press, or I, I forgot exactly what happened. The original version was burned. Um, uh, it, it, maybe it was the FBI that was going to sue. I forgot what the circumstances were. But the second edition then came out after the lawsuit. Um, but In the Spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Matheson. It's just a wonderful book, and you should read it. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a, it's a really hard story to talk about and to tell and and to really do it any justice it would take take me a couple of hours really. But he's been in jail since he's been in jail over 25 years. Yeah, in maximum security um He's been very sick, very sick, and he's very sick now. And I don't know if he's getting any treatment, what kind of treatment he's getting, but he gets moved every few years to another maximum security. Yeah. 
So a lot of this conversation has been uh, dealing with like law or legal aspects of like indigenous. Um, so a lot of the conversation has been about like law or legal aspects of indigenous struggles. Um, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on uh, like direct action and self-defense and like groups like West Coast Warriors and stuff like that. Um, just what you thought about that or any comments. Hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. I'm all for direct action. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm asking. I guess uh, some people like to demonize direct action or like self-defense. So I was just, I just wanted to hear some comments or maybe, you know, on that or, you know. Oh, okay. I, I gotcha. I gotcha. What, what we've been talking about um, um, this evening has been um, advocacy on different levels. Levels of legal action, um, advocacy on an international level, UN, human rights, um, and what about direct action? What about going to the street? Going to the streets? Um, oh, I'm all for that. Absolutely, absolutely. The work that Greenpeace does. Um, oh, uh, Amazon Alliance, etc. There. Excuse me. Advocacy, in, and this is just my opinion, takes on many, many levels. And it, it depends on your passion. It, de I think, depends on your talent and what you want to do. All right? it, it doesn't have to be, well, that's what that person does, so that's what I think I should do. And just because he's good at it, I have to do it that way. No. No. Um, just because somebody's a good surgeon and, and I admire that certainly isn't going to be something that I should do, you know? Um, or a judge. It's just not going to work for me. It's that passion that works for you and I think when you find that passion, that, that your talent just naturally blossoms from there. When, when you feel like it's just not coming together, that's probably not for you. Yeah, but, but direct, direct action in taking to the streets is my feeling what needs to be done right now. Um, the complacency for what is happening so much in this country, is, it just astonishes me. You know, um, some of us old geezers would never have put up with some of the things, Connie, right? that we have seen that have been going on the past 20, 25 years. No way we would have just gone to the streets. That's it. I have to share with you what um, a sister from the South said to me a few months ago. And I'm not going to tell you what country, um, but from South America. She said to me, Sister, um, I don't, I don't understand your country. And, and Bush was president at that time. And I said, what do you mean? She says, what, what your president just, just did and said. Um, she said, if, if my president did that, we would take to the streets. It may take us uh, a long weekend to remove him, but we would take him out. <laughs> She was apologizing that it might take a long weekend, but we would remove him. <laughs> we would have several million people on the street. 
And she wasn't kidding either. She was dead serious, dead serious. But the, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I was in South America a few weeks ago. And yes, yes, the, the organizing and the numbers, the numbers are huge. So yes, they, yes, they can do that. Yeah, they can organize several million people. Uh-huh, that quickly. But the, the complacency of, of it, it's just, it, it's just stunning. Yeah, and, and the, the, the passion of the youth is always what I, I count on that will make those changes. That's what I am counting on, that your generation, the youth that are here, will do that. Will say, that's it. We're, that's it. We're not, we're not going to accept this. And that's it. We're not going to put up with it. And you've, you've done it. You've begun to do it. And you have to do it. Because it, you, ha you just have to. I know. And we're counting on you to do that. Sue, so, yeah. Just quickly, where can we obtain a copy of this? You can go to the UN website and um, get it off the website. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to find. Yeah. And raise one. Um, so um, you just mentioned that you were in South America, and I was just wondering, um, in uh, countries that um, have, you know, new socialist regimes that um, are not so new, but, um, you know, that are riding this wave, um, how have indigenous rights um, been affected by those um, regimes, and how does that compare to um, countries that have opted not to go on that route, on that socialist route, or socialist route? Well, I think countries in the, in the South who um, are ignoring um, their in indigenous um, peoples, um, the citizens within their indigenous citizens um, are finding they're making a huge mistake. Huge mistake because their numbers are are so so strong. And what what I see is. Um, the in indigenous peoples are strongly organized, whether it's through labor unions a lot of times, um, or whether it's through socialist movements. Um, and they will usually represent a region, an Andean region, uh, for instance, the Amazon region. So, so it's several million people. And uh, their leadership will be chosen from that area. And then they send their leadership to specific meetings. But they are strongly organized. And governments who ignore, um, ignore indigenous uh, calls to justice and calls to listening to their voice are really doing it, doing uh, a disservice not only to indigenous peoples, but do it, do it at their peril. And I think what you, what the world saw in Peru um, right after the permanent forum in May, in June of this past year, was mining companies um, who were in Peru, who were polluting um, and or mining uh, in Peru at, um, yeah, I'm not touching the mic, uh, and, um, and doing it without the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. Um, and in those areas, and indigenous peoples wanted them out 
or wanted them to clean up their mess and went down went into those mining areas by the millions and started demonstrating um, and then the police came in the military came in you had several people who were killed and it became an international nightmare um, and an international uh, embarrassment for the government of Peru. So it was badly handled um, and now you have something that's going to be uh, um, brought up at the next permanent forum and it's being brought up and it's going to be very bad and is very bad for Peru which just before the permanent form and during the permanent form there were uh, discussions on what was going on in Peru and there were demonstrations in front of the the Peruvian consulate about what was going on so it wasn't as if nobody knew that this was a tinderbox and sure enough the people went home and things exploded so this is this this has got this is something that has to be addressed and the people are organized they are organized in the south um, in a much different way than they are in the north um, in the south you're talking about um, do or die circumstances you know not that it isn't bad in the north but um, it is very bad in the South, extremely bad. South in South America, yes, very bad. Hi. Hello. I know. <laughs> um, okay, so I have two two very quick questions that I think are a one or two word answer, and then a third sort of jumping back to Leonard Peltier. <laughs> The, f the first question, I guess, just being that there's such a concrete thing tomorrow, November 5th, what can we do, you know, to amplify the voices of the people who are meeting with President Obama? Is there a simple action we can take somewhere we can go? Um, I hadn't heard about this, and I think especially for a non-Native person to know where we can get these resources to support this. So is there a place I can go to um, to take an action so we can commit to right now going home and sending an email, making a call, whatever it is? Um, the second, I think, also quick thing is um, a source of just a reliable source of what's happening with Native communities because I think there's f is so much internal things that we don't understand. I don't understand as not being Native that I don't know what is a reliable source of information. Um, and the third question, getting back to Peltier, um, you know, when Clinton released 11 Puerto Rican political prisoners by executive clemency. It was certainly not because he had some commitment to independence for Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, there was a backdoor, some, my understanding is there was a backdoor deal. Cuba traded some people. I mean, and there was these political prisoners that were held, being held by the United States. Do you think there's any kind of route on that level, an international level, to, for, 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 for securing freedom for Peltier? Well, let, let, let me try the, the first question um, about tomorrow. Um, I would wait and see if there's any press on it. And um, if there is, and if anything comes out where uh, le indigenous leaders made a statement about the adoption of the declaration, um, uh, if there was a statement, it's going to be on the website of the uh, NCAI, which is the National Congress of American Indians. They'll make the announcement for sure. Okay? Second, so if that does happen, all right, send an email to President Obama stating that you agree with the tribal leaders um, supporting the declaration and 
um, encourage the president to adopt the declaration in all due haste and CC myself as North American representative. Okay? And then I will send the president a letter saying that I've been getting um, <clears throat> encouragement from North America insisting that he sign this declaration. Okay? All right. Um, and my email is Tanya, T O N Y A, at A I L A N Y C dot org. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What was the other question? Is there a source, like, um, you know, especially I think like for upstate New York issues, you know, I, I don't know. There was this ballot initiative on the uh, that I voted in. I only voted for like two things, about twenty choices. The ballot initiative saying they want to run a power line through St. Lawrence County. And I knew I had heard that there were issues with native land rights in St. Lawrence County. And I said, am I voting on something to put a power line through native land? So I didn't vote on it. And like, you know, I don't know where is there a reliable source, you know, of, of, of what are the land issues, what are the indigenous issues? Um, <clears throat> say in that area? That area of the New York particularly, but also, you know, Logan. That area, there's a uh, a newspaper called the the Eastern Door, um, and I'm sure they have a website, and they handle issues in that particular area. Indian Country Today is a pretty good newspaper. They handle national issues. And Indians, and it's Indians with a Z. <laughs> Indians.com is a good website to go to. They usually, and they have lots of links. That's a good one. And NCAI, the National Congress of American Indians. And also check out um, onadaga.com, no, dot org, My Nation. I, th I think we keep a pretty decent website. One of our young people updates the, the website because we're doing a lot of environmental work. All right, especially on that Marcellus shale business that's going on. Um, mining companies want to come in and dig through the, um, through the hard rock to get at the natural gas. And everybody knows about that natural gas. It's been there forever. Uh, a lot of it goes through our territories. Um, what the mining, what the drilling companies aren't telling you, is that they don't drill down; they drill sideways. All right, and they're going to be hitting all kinds of water watersheds, and they need gallons and gallons of water per minute to drill. Um, this, the New York City has voted it down because the speaker doesn't want it. Um, the speaker of the city council doesn't want it because the water to the city comes from up here. Yeah. So it's safe for up here. Um, but there are people in Pennsylvania, poor farmers in Pennsylvania who have come to the have come to my nation at Onondaga uh, asking for help because they know we do environmental work 
and um, uh, and some of our people have gone to visit their farms and it was so bad that um, they had to leave because they just couldn't breathe. The gas fumes were so bad and their children have blisters all over them. They can't drink their water. Um, but they sign contracts with the drilling companies because their farms, you know, don't earn any money. They are hard up and they needed the money. And they just told them, well, it's really okay, just don't light a match. <laughs> really, that's what they said. And it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. And they don't know what to do. But their well water is now polluted. But that's what the drilling is, not down, it's sideways. But they're not telling the people that. And they're also not revealing um, that you need chemicals to get through the shale. And they're not saying what the, the drilling companies are not uh, revealing what the chemicals are that they're using to drill with. One more? Yeah. Ah, we'll take one more, Connie, and then we'll wrap her up. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Peru and the Quechua indigenous people because I was there the summer of 2007. So I saw um, two citywide car strikes. So I had to walk like miles to go to the school that I had to go to. And um, like you said, they're very organized. And if any was to bring a car, then you know bricks would be thrown, things like that. But we performed in the strikes. We went with mm -hmm. them. Um, I just want to know if there's any recent rights granted to the Quechua people that you know of or any actions that have really been taken by the government to them about the mining issue too because I know about that so what, what if anything you know about that well the government of Peru um, did vote to adopt the declaration right now the declaration is not a, a legally binding instrument right and we we should know that. I mean, declarations are not legally binding. But what we have to um, count on is the political will of governments. Now, the, the ambassador to the UN, um, Ambassador Chavez, it was the chairperson um, who worked on the declaration who worked on the working group to adopt this declaration. And he did his job so well that he got that ambassadorship appointment. You know, I'm not saying that he got it because of his work, but he did a very good job. And we need to um, put pressure on the government of Peru to uphold um, the principles of the declaration um, in in reference to its indigenous populations and peoples so that it, there is political will when it comes to the peoples of Peru, especially the indigenous peoples. Um, and this needs to be brought to their attention over and over again. They signed on to it, they made a commitment, and first we thank them and we thank them for their leadership. And they were leaders in this role. But now there's a difficult situation within their borders. And the world is watching them. And we should all have concern for the Quechua people. Right? Especially when we've watched the, the slaughter um, and we saw it on television. We're not making this up. We saw it. Um, and the death of not just Quechua people, but unfortunately of soldiers as well. Um, and this is a serious situation. And this needs to be addressed. And it needs to be addressed quickly. Right? 
And here we have a declaration that we can use in a situation like this. Because the de declaration not only addresses these rights, but it also talks about resolution, arbitration, restitution, which can come into play in serious situations like this. Now there's a, um, a special rapporteur on the human rights of indigenous peoples who I believe has been invited to Peru um, and has written a report and you should go to his website. His name is James Anaya, um, A-N-A-Y-A. -A. Um, and he, his report would have, um, he, he would have issued his report September 28th at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And that would be up. Um, I remember because I was there, I made an intervention on, um, at the Human Rights Council. And there was a dialogue with the Human Rights uh, Special Rapporteur. And he gave his report. And I believe there's an, a section that ha that, uh, that's on Peru. So you should, you should read that. Okay? Well, <laughs> we just cannot thank Sister Tanya enough for an incredible evening of oh, both information, knowledge, and heart, <laughs> and, uh, and, and pointing us once again at the seventh generation that must be paramount to us in everything that we do. And I want to mention that our next set of seminars, the spring seminars, four seminars, will be on climate change. And um, we'll be doing our bit for the seventh generation. And we'll also hopefully be talking about Marce the Marcellus Shale as part of, part of one of the issues that's become quite, quite important. So. This has been an extraordinarily wonderful evening. We want to thank you so much, so much, Tanya, oh, for welcome. being with us.